So um, listen, I'm very excited about today's episode because I know that we're going to learn a lot. And while Peter is just trying to sort herself out, let me just start by saying that hello everyone and welcome to EB Speaks. My name is Ibina Bo Enebi, and I want to thank and appreciate my subscribers and my faithful viewers for joining us today. And if this is your first time of joining EB Speaks and you're wondering what this channel is about, I will tell you, my channel is a knowledge-based channel that provides you with transformational information. So you don't just hear information, you hear transformational information that can help you change your life. And I do this by bringing everyday people like you and me, thought leaders and experts to share their stories and expertise, because I believe that collectively that our stories and our expertise serve as streetlights and survival kits for those coming behind us. And it is for this reason that I have my special guest, Rita Amiri Chinda, to talk about how to grow and protect your digital assets and intellectual property. Feel free to subscribe to my channel, Ibinabo NAB, and feel free to follow me on my social media handles, um, LinkedIn, Ibinabo NAB, Instagram, Ibinabo NAB, Facebook, Ibinabo NAB, and you can also check out my website, ibinabonab.com, for some interesting reads. And uh, before we delve into the conversation proper, I would like to give us a brief introduction. Rita, are you there? Yes, I'm Rita, still here. I am looking at your resume, and I am super, super, super proud of you. I will just run through it. Uh, because it's a lot. So Rita Amuvichinda is a lecturer at the River State University, an intellectual property consultant for IGA Nigeria Limited, who is the heritage consultant for the Lagos State Government, where she provides legal service on how to commercialize and monetize the culture tourism and heritage of Lagos State by exploring the intangible assets the state, the state has. She holds a master's degree in international, in intellectual property and information technology from the University of Derby, United Kingdom. And she hosts the podcast IPS series, which features conversations on recent intellectual property cases and developments globally and has 100 episodes published with 19 blog post editions on SOPTAP. Rita, you have quite a lot. And guys, listen, uh, Rita, do you have um your website? Yeah. Um, no, a website per se, but um most of my links can be found on Linktree. So um, if you need to get access to my podcast or my LinkedIn profile or Instagram or Facebook, that's where you can find um, most of my details. Oh, yeah. Rita, like, I am so, so impressed. As a matter of fact, you, 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 um, there's so many, so many things here. You featured in the inaugural edition of the All Things IP Africa magazine 2021. You were a recipient of the Young Legal Profession Recipient Award of Excellence. In 2020, you won the R WIPR Influential Woman in IP Trailblazer. I mean, it's a lot. And I just want to say that I'm super proud of you. And thank you so much for coming to Evie Speaks today. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Rita, I just want us to delve in quickly into this whole concept of intellectual property. But before we talk about intellectual property, because for us to talk about intellectual property, we have to talk about how intellectual property come about. Yeah. So what exactly are intellectual properties? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um... 
the question is kind of like a it's going to be a crash course in like two seconds okay because <laughs> when you are talking about intellectual property you're looking at it from the intangible assets uh, which involves um, the use of human intellect to create um, products in form of books songs um, pictures um, manufacturing of things that solve issues within the society but the, the the benefit of all of this is that it must be commercialized commercialized so you must use it to make money you don't just make it and keep it there for fancy so that you know it gathers dust and the rest of it and it is territorial in nature what that means is only the jurisdictions for instance since i'm based in nigeria it's only in nigeria that i get to enjoy the legal backing and protection of the law if and when I do register it. So you have copyrights which whose protection is automatic in nature. Um, so long as it's in a fixed or tangible format, um, it has an original character. Um, it, doesn't ma- it doesn't matter the quality of the copyrighted work. So some examples of eligible copyrighted work as provided under the new Copyright Act 2022 are uh, musical works, literary work, artistic works, um, sound recording, broadcast, and cinematograph works. So each of these eligible works are entitled to some exclusive rights that the author, who is the first person who creates the work under as defined under the act, can do, such as right to reproduce, right to publish, perform in public, um, to adapt, to translate. Uh, and any other thing that's provided under the act. Then you have trademark, which, could, which acts as a source identifier. For instance, the name of your, your program, your event, uh, my podcast, IQ series. So trademarks will protect names, words, sounds, slogan, um, numbers, um, color, um, smell. Um, so basically, for you to um have a trademark in what meets the requirement as provided for under section 9 and 10 of the nigerian copyright of the nigerian trademark which is it must be capable of distinguishing and also it must be distinctive in nature then there are certain requirements such as not being similar to an already existing mark or the name of a chemical or anything that will cause confusion amongst your consumers then you have industrial design in which protects the visual appearance. So you can see my necklace. This is the visual appearance of this necklace. Um, the logos you find, the combinations of colors and lines for textiles, um, just basically the aesthetic features that a product has. The paints behind me, the laptop, the features of my laptop, the ring lights, everything then patent protects how all of these things work how we are communi- able to communicate you know borderlessly um what makes the ring light turn up um, what makes your laptop to function what makes your phone to function those are patents and for both patent and industrial design it must be new it must meet the requirement for the test of being new uh, for industrial design it must be new and not contrary to public morality while for patent, it must not be obvious to a skilled person. So someone who is in the same line of business as you cannot figure out how that product was made. Um, it must be inventive and capable of industrial application, and it must be novel. In order for you to get a patent as well, you must not have published it to the, like done any kind of publication stating that, oh, we just created um, a new product that is going to solve X, Y, Z. That's where the disclosure to the public, and it will not meet the requirement of being new. So the examiners will not grant you a patent. Now, all of these IPs have term of duration. For instance, patent is for a term of 20 years. From the day you apply, that's when your time starts counting. And once um, the term of duration elapses, it goes into the public domain, which is free for any other person to use. Um, industrial design is for five years. For subjects to renewal, you can protect it for further consecutive two years. So in total, 15 years. Whereas for trademark, Trademark lasts as long as you consistently use that trademark. So under the trademark, you have 45 classes that you can register a product or a service. So 
if it's the entertainment service, if it's um, you own a manufacturing company and you want to produce some stuff, you have to go through all of those lists. Then for copyright, it's between 50 to 70 years post um, the, the author's death, then inclusive of the lifetime that the author was alive. So if the person is alive for say 89 years or 70 years, once he dies, um, his heirs or successors in title to get to money, get to monetize and commercialize. For instance, you see um, artists or musicians like Whitney Houston, Prince, um, Jet Li, and the rest of them. Their families are the one actually monetizing in terms of licensing. Um, sex yeah, elements. Michael Jackson as well. Yeah. Yes. So the license an estate. Elements. Yeah, so the estate will be the one in charge or anyone who has the right or who bought the rights um, to his catalog. So you're not selling all of the rights. So like I stated, in, in, when I started talking, I said for copyright, you have different exclusive rights that you can explore. So is it the publishing rights? Is it the adaptation rights? Is it the translation rights? Is it the, the reproduction rights you, you, you got? So... It gets, it gets to show you that there are commercial value, your product, your intellectual, your human intellectual, your intangible asset has commercial value. You just need to sit down and reevaluate that and you know take it up from there. So that's like a crash course <laughs> on intellectual property. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you for that because you put you know a lot into perspective. But I want to ask you this question. I want us to, to break it down, right? To the regular Joe, to the regular person on the street. And the reason why I was very much interested in this concept in this particular episode was because, you know, today in the social media world, everybody posts something on the internet, Facebook, we have things on, on Twitter, we have things on LinkedIn, we have, everyone is a digital creator, you know, so, Without knowing, people are generating digital assets without knowing. So you could like have a blog, for example. You could have a Facebook page, for example. You know, you could have a platform that you do things that you like. You take pictures, you put it up. You uh, you have a, a, a thought, you put it up on your social media or Facebook or whatever. So I'm asking you that in this dispensation that we live our, our social media contents and everything we throw out into social media part of our digital assets and do we need to then protect them as our intellectual properties okay thank you for that question um so first of i'll say ip which is intellectual property has evolved from the manual age to the digital age to the automation stage. So you're talking in terms of the, the, the industrial revolution that we've all passed through. And yeah. for each of these stages, you find that there are elements of intellectual property that um, are present within this revolution. Yes. Now we are now in the fourth industrial revolution where um, it's easy for anyone to be a creator. Um, what would then define that in the digital era would be one, what are the terms and conditions as provided for under the social media platform that you're using? Um, in terms of jobs now, you're being, you've been hired to create content for a company or you've been paid to act as an influencer. Um, so all of this conversation will start to come in when the government starts to look inwards as to see, okay, what is the benefit or use of digital creator. So do you own your intangible asset as a digital creator? Yes. Um, your pictures which you create and put online belongs to you. So if you go through, and I don't know how many of us go through terms and conditions of social media platforms that we interact with, but then there's a caveat there that states that whatever content you're putting out there, you are verifying that it actually belongs to you. Yeah. So which is why you see that they have internal mechanism for resolving um, IP related dispute in terms of the copyright or unauthorized of the trademark, say logo um, on this platform. So you can report those contents. So interestingly, under our new copyright act, 
Um, the law now makes provision for a takedown notice. It never used to be there before. It was more prevalent in the US where they had the, uh, uh, it's called the Digital Millennia something else. So a DMC where you can just put, do a takedown notice and you know, the law would do its course, interact with the uh, internet service providers to take down infringing content. So your videos which you create, those are your works. But when you decide to use or sync someone's music or sound recording into your video, uh, are you infringing? Those would be the question. For instance, platforms like TikTok, um, Facebook, Instagram all have licenses from hmm. all of these recording companies that allows you to use certain audio sounds that you find on this platform, which is why you see sometimes your post might get taken down when, um, let's say, within a particular jurisdiction, yeah. the license wasn't gotten there. So you read the clauses and it states it's not in all jurisdictions, just certain jurisdictions. So you need to figure out what is applicable in your jurisdiction, uh, what, um, who do you need to meet, um, what contracts are you signing. So again, um, when you're dealing with influencers who actually put up products out there or do adverts for products out there, they're kind of vouching and you know, putting themselves and saying, oh, I've used this product, I'm doing X, Y, Z. So I'm aware that the US um, uh, Federal Trade Commission is very proactive in terms of making sure that influencers uh, do their due diligence and are held accountable or responsible when a product they try to market um, is deceptive in nature. Same in Nigeria here where our community, the advertising agency or commission is trying to crack down on, um, you know, vloggers, bloggers from, you know, doing adverts. There's a process for that, but because we're now in the digital era where it's easy for anyone to sit, do a recording and post online, you know, that, that's not vetted. Then you have issues where you need to abide uh, or promote maids in Nigeria things. For instance, the, law, the, the agency is saying we need you to use more Nigerian um, content, models, yeah. yes, your model, Nigerian models, Nigerian content. Or oh, so, is it my video? Is it my volume? Is it? Can you hear us now? Is it still low? Thank you for letting us know. Is it better? I can I can see her. Is it, is it better know. now? Because okay, I can hear, I can hear you very well. <laughs> okay, um, so. Um, issues as to advertising law, um, contracts. Are you actually signing contracts to determine who owns what? So under the Copyright Act, it provides that um, if, if you're employed or hired or commissioned to do something, it belongs to the person that hired you as long as it's in a written agreement. And the same thing with licensing when you get licensed to use certain copyrighted work, elements of a copyrighted work, um, an exclusive license, which is between party A and party B, must be registered or in in a written document. Whereas for a non-exclusive one, it could be oral, it could be by conduct, or at least you know do a contract. But in all of these things, make sure you're documenting and stating who owns what, how long the person can use it, where is the person's limit, but never in perpetuity. Don't ever sign anything that has. Um, mm. you assigning or giving out anything in perpetuity that's that's money made for the person in infinity you know but i i don't know if that answers your question but creating content and owning content now um it's more easier however you have issues as to um ease of reproduction where it's easy for anyone to you know um post your movie content that you just published on say or you distributed, or you, you you know you you are now premiering on Netflix or Amazon or in the theater. I mean, twenty four hours. We've seen that happen with um, Gangs of Lagos and um, Coming to America too, and some other movies as well. You've seen books being um ebooks being produced and shared on social media platforms like the Chimamanda Zikora book. Um, pictures easy for someone to remove your watermark. And you know, we post it as their own, or just because they want to post it. Maybe it's a picture of them. So, in regards to picture, we had um, disputes in the US where um, celebrities were posting image of themselves, and paparazzis or photographers who make money off taking pictures of uh, people in the limelight had to sue some of them for copyright infringement. 
And in the US, the law provides that in order for you to sue for copyright infringement, you must have registered that particular work with the copyright office in the US. Now our new copyright act provides that you should. So the word used there is you may register your copyrighted work. Then it goes further to say that, however, in the event of a dispute whereby you register your copyright with the Nigerian Copyright Commission, you can ask them for a certified true copy of the work that you registered and then present it as evidence or as a document in the dispute that is currently ongoing. Then now we are dealing with issues as to um, deep fakes where someone can just use your, your image and put somewhere else and someone thinks it's you. Um, this conversation we keep happening because one is the internet. We're dealing with um, unauthorized use of people's images as known as image rights or right of publicity. We do not have a specific law that guides that, but we have certain precedents that the courts in Nigeria have analyzed and said, okay, this person was actually trying to monetize or take advantage of this person's image, name, and likeness. Um, <clears throat> they are dealing with conversations now as to whether AI can be an author in the US. We haven't started experiencing that, but we had a bit of um, a, a IP related dispute in terms of someone going to meet um, a picture that was taken during a rally um, early this year. And you know, this conversation came up as to, okay, who actually owns the picture? Does the person have the right to actually mint that as an NFT? Um, you know, then you're dealing with regulation, <laughs> law, um, co collaborators. Um, so you also have provisions under the New Corporate Act that states that if someone, if I've taken efforts to make sure that someone does not use my work without my consent, and you circumvent or go behind my back to remove, to bypass those protective measures I've put, you are liable for infringement. So, and, and now the act now has like minimum sanctions for infringers under the new act. So while the law is trying to evolve and you know be on the same pace with technology, you find out that um, human intellect creators will keep creating, people will keep being innovative, they keep trying to see how to produce stuff or you know solve an issue. For instance, during the pandemic, we had um, Hanifa. I don't know how many of us know Hanifa, but she was the first fashion de designer that had like a virtual runway show. And then you had big brands like um, Tom Ford and the rest, Bulber, and just trying to emulate or imitate what she did. And they had this big international. Um, um, media house that made a publication stating that all oh, these bigger brands did what has never been done. And luckily, the internet came to her defense. They're like, nah, a black woman did this. You're not going to take that shiny reef from her. So you're going to deal with mis misinformation, um, you know, people trying to you know, acknowledge your efforts or contribution within a particular territory, um, you know, all of this conversation, but that's about it, you know, re regarding your question. Perfect. Now, the, and, and, and again, thank you very much for that. I was really very, you know, um, impressed with how uh, Anifa was protected by the internet, how the big brands wanted to take her shine, and then the internet came to her rescue. But again, I, I want to ask you this, right? Because I'm really very interested in the digital assets. And you, there's a word that you just said that just pew, rang a bell and you talked about monetizing. The reason yeah. why I'm asking this question is because a lot of us, a lot of people are unconsciously creating assets, digital assets, by virtue of the nature of the world that we live in today. So we are putting out contents, we're writing quotes, we're doing all sorts of things. In what way can we monetize those assets? And I like what you said, you talked about the fact that we're in the fourth industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution being the internet. And of course we have artificial intelligence also, you know, swaying and all of that. So for a lot of people, Content creation is another way to grow assets for themselves. So how can they monetize those assets for themselves 
and for their posterity. Okay, um, a very interesting question. Well, um, monetization, I would say, depends on your strategy, um, okay. where you want to go. So as someone who's just starting out as a creative, are you just doing it for passion or for the likes? Um, and I'm focusing more on people that create um, content online now. Yes, so because a lot actually, of people, a lot of people are in that space. They could be sitting on money without knowing. So initially, it starts with a passion, like with interest. Oh, I was bored because COVID was what brought most of these things on. You know, so initially it starts with okay, a passion, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, so that's where I'm going with it. So once you have like you defined what exactly you want to do, do you want to make money off it, or you just want to keep putting out free content? So you also have what is called the Creative Commons license, where people just create content for written content or pictures, copyrighted work mainly for free, and they just put it um, in the public domain and use the CC license to do whatever it is, as long as they are being acknowledged as the author. Yeah. However, in an instance where your goal is majorly to make money, then you now have to tell yourself, ah, this is not a part-time thing. Uh, I, need to start <laughs> I like the way you said it's not a part-time thing. <laughs> yeah, because IP is like it's supposed to be a long-term goal for either a creator or an innovator. If it's not a long-term goal for you, then it's it's gonna you're gonna have a lot of issues. So for instance, for, for songwriters now, most people who are in the music industry, you have like different stakeholders that they make money from either being a composer, um, contributing to sound recording or whatever. And that is not a part-time thing for them. Oh, I want to write for uh, Usher, or I want to write for T, or I want to write for David Doe. That's a goal that is being identified. So your goal now would be to strategically position yourself where they can see you. So this is where your digital footprint will also come into place because we're in the era where data is king. And once you figure that out, you now have to um, create a money-making structure. Are you going to opt for licensing where you go into an exclusive arrangement with um, one person or a non-exclusive arrangement with several persons and they pay you a stipend in form of royalties for the use for, say, a term of one year, six months, two years, subject to renewal. For instance, the theme song for, uh, what's the series now? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name. Um, it went viral, but with the song I'm referring to is Running Up That Hill. That song was created in the 1980s. And because it was synced, into the series and used as the team song. It had over eight, I think 8,000%, like it just became like top, top. Yeah, the assets, with, because of the song, yeah? Be, yeah. yeah, because so of the series, that, yeah. Yeah, so licensing for an artist is a quick way for you to make money. So sync licensing, where your song or sound recording can be used in films, in series, in adverts, whatever it is. Um, I know Shole Wainka's book is being um, adapted into a movie by Ebony Life. That's another way for you to make money. So you're exploring all the exclusive rights that you have, right to publish. Um, who has the publishing right for Tommy's book, uh, Book of Children? I think it's Book of Children. Yeah, that's, that should be the name of the book. Um, who has the right to translate it into different languages? Um, those subtitles you see in movies, that's some, somebody is making money off that. Okay, my, it's, it's a South Korean, because I love South Korean movies and series. Yeah. And there's always translating it for you. Someone's making money off that. Um, so you, you want to get its franchise deal. You're authorized to use the logo of KFC in Nigeria. You're giving, you're not giving the secrets to the recipe. So I did not mention trade secret because trade secrets, um, it's a very delicate type of intellectual property because you have to take the extra, you have to make, take extra precaution to protect that confidential information that basically gives you an edge in the society. For instance, Coca-Cola, a lot of persons have tried to re replicate Coca-Cola, but they are not, they kind of, they are always missing something. For instance, our big, uh, big pillar, 
you know, mm-hmm. we have a company in Nigeria <laughs> called Bucola, and it's obvious that you are trying to, you know, create Coca-Cola, but what else? Um, how can someone use your logo, your name, um, your slogan? So you find out brands like Adidas, are, they are always fighting anyone or seeing anyone that makes attempt to use anything that has to do with a stripe. So four stripe logo, two stripe logo, all of those conversations. Those are people that know what they have. And that's because they've invested time and money and legal. People don't take legal seriously, which is why you always now, you are now in the area of um, social media collapse. Is it for me to go on Instagram live or go on Twitter and do like a, a hundred threads like, like Kanye ranting about what this person did not do to me and what this person did to me, all of this conversation. So do you want to opt for a licensing model structure? Do you want to assign your rights to say a collecting body or a collective management organization if you are a creative? Um, for Nigeria, we have about four of them. We have the um, Audiovisual Rights Society, you have the Reprong, you have COSON, and you have um, MCS10. And each of these collective management organizations have duties to negotiate deals on your behalf. That's like I said, it's almost to use your copyrighted work. Um, so you're in the film industry and someone is um, showcasing your movie in their hotel without getting a license. That's an infringement. So the body's job is to write to them saying, you do not have the right to actually showcase or distribute or publish this movie to the general public. Come and have a conversation with us. Pay a blanket license fee for a year, and you know you're free to use it. Are you also going to be going to collaborations or partnerships? So, for instance, Fenty X Louis Vuitton or Rihanna X Pumas. All of those conversations. So, or let's use um, the Kanye West Adidas deal, the easy deal that you know went viral last year because Kanye was on his in his element at that point in time and. You know, they were losing a lot of money and investors. So there's a lot of conversations that are going where you have to be strategic. Do you want to share um, control over certain rights that you have in relation to your intellectual property? Or do you want to retain all the rights? All of that can be documented in the contract and put in a contract. Always have your contracts and make sure that you have your own lawyer to vet for you. So for instance, sometimes in... Um, a musical deal, you will see that a clause will say that you have given your lawyer the document to read and they have advised you on your rights and all of that. That's like a disclaimer. So tomorrow, you'll come and say, Oh, these people, they coerced me into doing this or they deceived me into doing XYZ. Meanwhile, you did not do the musical by giving a lawyer because you were carried away with the promises of you're going to get to a house in Banana Island, a duplex in, in London get to private jet and all of this conversation. So that's how, um, as a creative in digital era, if you want to monetize your work, you have to be strategic, you have to have good data, you have to document, um, make sure that whatever brands you're collaborating for, you can actually vouch for it because your name, image, likeness can be monetized. Um, if you want to opt or build, say, a merchandise industry around your name that you've built over a time timeline, your good your reputation, all of these conversations. So just have a good strategy and make sure that you have an IP lawyer um, by your side. But if you still don't want an IP lawyer, don't ask on you. But yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, there's a question I want to ask you. And what Are there any emerging trends or challenges intellectual property in intellectual property that we should be aware of ah uh, oh well so currently i would say within nigeria we're dealing with digital piracy where people are you know being very smart instead of being innovative so i put out a a post and instead of you to actually acknowledge that you are inspired by this post you just copy and paste it's, it's, it's you find it a lot on linkedin and twitter where people are you just copy. so i i came across this post on linkedin so it's by he does a lot of sports related content very insightful i think his name is john pom you know something like that but i came across him on twitter and then i found him on linkedin and he made this post about how what's this fine man's name in um Hey. The, the Clive's husband, what's his name again? Uh, yes. 
uh, he acted in an Adams project. I keep forgetting, he's kind of a very funny guy. Uh, can't remember his name, but anyways. Is so it he Nigerian? No, he's American. So he Pete? made this book. There's no Brad Pitt too. Ah, I will tell you when I remember his name, but I just told you one of the movies that I re- I saw him perform at, which is also streaming on Netflix. This is not an advert, anyway, it's an old movie. It came out last year. So um, so this guy made the post about him or how you know he made money outside acting. And some other dude on LinkedIn, word for word, copied and pasted, and he was getting a lot of traction. And you know, the thing is, when something goes viral, it will, def- it will eventually reach the original creator. So he goes under his comment and writes, next time, make sure you acknowledge me as the author of this post. And I was like, that's, that's like an OG level for me. So get. So you I, can I ask you what's the meaning of OG? <laughs> Sorry, oh. like the, my the children, other, the, gangster. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the master. He goes back uh, to gangster. the master. Mm-hmm. And you know, those conversations come up, and then you're asking yourself, "What do you do in that instance?" I think I kind of I've missed track on the question you asked, me, but can you take it again? Hi, Jesus. <laughs> But it's okay. Like uh, it's okay. We would. I said, are there any emerging tr- and trends? Okay, so yeah, trends. So digital piracy was where I was going to. Where or plagiarism yeah. online, let people just copy your work. Um, we also seen a lot of. So last year we had a dispute that was football related. A football um, uh, photographer. He's a sports journalist, but takes pictures of sports events. So he took a picture of Kalechi Hen and Cho and. Somehow, Kalechi liked the picture, and then he lifted the picture, removed the watermark of the photographer, and this guy was ranting on, on he was talking about it on Twitter. Wow. But guess what? Kalechi now went ahead to pin that particular picture. No apologies till today. At least no public apology that I'm aware of. So this conversation come up where you know you, you make take the extra measures to make sure that nobody like so you see ip series in my in my content and then you remove it and repost it without saying this was sh- all this shot by or done by then we also had instances where um so it was a big it wasn't a big case per se but someone's design was replicated the exact carry so it's a, it's called the carry dress case so it had, I think the lady that makes it is in Cote d'Ivoire, so, but she's in one of these African countries, but she's big and well-known for using kauris to create dresses. And some, not so, so a Nigerian fashion designer replicated the exact design for a famous Nigerian actress who wore it to one of the big um, movie premiere events, and it became a tussle. There was this and this letter um, published to the photographer, but then those conversations come up where certain disputes are, have like short term shelf life where it happens and then it just disappears. You know, uh, we've seen a lot of, um, um, you know, people using images. So for instance, we recently had Huda Basi break the world, a Guinness World Record for cooking for 100 hours and people are already using her image to make quotes. Oh, we are cooking this. Oh. Um, we are doing X, Y, Z with Hilda's images. So that's the use, unauthorized use of her image because you're misleading people to think that she's affiliated to your brand or to your product when that is not the case. But then you look at it from the international space. We have not started dealing with generative AI-related work or cases in Nigeria. We've not started dealing with NFTs, someone minting um, your product and wanted to sell it for a lesser price. For instance, the Meta Beckin case where someone minted the Beckin, you know how much a Beckin bag cost. And someone minted the Beckin bags and put it um, as an NFT for $150. And he got a season. So a season this letter is when you confirm that the work that the person used actually belongs to you and not them. And you've made conscious efforts trying to tell them, oh, see, dude, can you stop using this, my work? And the person is like, oh, beg, 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 leave me. And you have to reach out to your lawyer and explain all the deeds to him. Like, well, oh, this person is actually infringing on my work. I've confirmed it's actually my work. And you know, do a letter 
with the timeline stating I give you X, Y, Z, seven days to take down that content or whatever. So it, it became like the first digital IP case that it, the world, the international IP space was basically looking forward to. Then um, generative AI, AI um, a, a book author used an AI tool to create an image and did not disclose in her, her application that she used an AI an AI tool to create the image. And then when she got the copyright, she did the publication. Oh, we now have the first AI that owns a copyright in the United States. And the copyright office is like, no, 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 that's, that's a bit mis misleading. So she had to redo her application again, which she was very upset about from her comments and feedback, you know. But then disclosure is very important. And that is one thing that I created into. So So um, the Nigerian government at some point pushed back so much on blockchain, but now we have like a blockchain policy, which which is kind of just applicable to just um, the governments as to how the government carries out their, their dealing in terms of transparency. We know all the good side, all the benefits of having using blockchain for your work. Um, but other than that, I would say in Nigeria, just piracy, counterfeiting, where people just want to be mischievous and sell lesser quality of things. Uh, but in the international space, it's more conversation on generative AI work, um, 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 dispute in the metaverse, NFTs, and the rest of them. But yeah, that's that's like long and short of it. Thank you so much, Vita. You know, of course, you're the expert, and I'm just sitting down there and listening as um, a regular person. So what mm. I have just learned from what you've said is this. Be careful the way you use people's images on social media. Yes. You could get into trouble. Be careful the way you take somebody's ideas and pose as yours. You could get into trouble. Be careful the way you use people's um, songs and stuff like that. You get into trouble. But you know that, for example, on Facebook, when you post uh, something on Facebook, uh, maybe a video or something on Facebook, if you go to the fa Facebook creator studio, they would ask you if you want uh, your video to be embedded. Even, even in, in YouTube, they would ask you, do you want this video to be embedded? Would you like anyone else to to use the video and stuff like that, you know, so you have the right to say yes or no. So I think that in that way, they kind of like protect you and protect, um, so you kind of like have control on how you want your image or your work to be, to be used, yeah? Yes, which is why when you go, if you have the opportunity of going through the terms and conditions, Say Facebook, just take your time, just Google kind of condition of Facebook or YouTube, for instance. It's clearly stated there that you cannot post content that does not belong to you. So putting it there means it's yours. I already know that um, IP, be it copyright or trademark, gives the creator the exclusive right to perform certain acts within that particular jurisdiction. So as applicable under your law, as governed by the Nigerian copyright law, trademark law, or the US law, the Ireland law, whichever law or jurisdiction you're based in, that you have um, a presence in, this is what we guide you. Then you also have issues relating to data protection, data privacy, cyber security related issues. That's now on a bigger scale where someone is using your content um, or they want to uh, transfer it to another jurisdiction, you need to do that in line with what the data protection commission or agency within your territory makes provision for in line with what is acceptable. So I've consented and said, this is mine. And I've put this out there. Can a third party then lift it and use it in another jurisdiction? So you'll not be looking at cross-border related this one. When it's not a cross-border, related this we are going to be having conversations on international treaties, international laws, um, which law will govern the disputes, uh, which which law, which court is going to actually hear the disputes in question, all of these conversations. Those are the things that you have to be dealing with um, in relation to, to you know, putting out content 
on social media platforms like that. You also make sure that you are in line with what these platforms provide. So you have what is called the fair dealing provision in Nigeria and fair use or some other civil oh, yeah, fair where, use, yes. whereby you can use a copyrighted content or a trademark content um, for non-commercial purpose. So is it for research purpose? Are you criticizing? Are you doing, are you reporting live? Are you, is it for privacy? So I don't know if you've heard about the Napster case um, where initially um, it was pre-Spotify and the rest of them. You were supposed to own, so you get a music to use private use. But then they now found out that people were using that platform to share, to distribute music to third parties without the consent of the original um, authors. So you find out that most times these relevant stakeholders within the creative space, such as the record label or the publishing companies, who always want to be proactive in terms of making sure that um, where they're supposed to be making money, someone's not taking advantage of it. So, okay, yeah, you put up a post on Facebook. Facebook has like, share, or if it's a Twitter repost or LinkedIn repost with it, all of those conversations. But then you're doing that within the confines of what the, the social media platform has no provisions for, whereby you can share this as long as you're not monetizing. It's when you start monetizing that the defense or thought of fair use or fair dealing will not protect you. So we never used to have the four-factor test um, whereby you determine whether the use of a work is for commercial purpose or not. But now the new copyright act now means provision for other than fair dealing, the four-factor test, whether um, the quantity you used, how, how much damage has it caused to the person, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all of those conversations. So that, that's about it anyways. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Rita, assuming somebody is listening to us today, and yeah. the person is interested in contacting you to find out more about your work and how they can work with you to protect their intangible assets. How do they contact you? So I only contact. <laughs> I only call them called IP series. Uh, I have a podcast and a newsletter. Uh, I'm also on Twitter with at IP Series One, but I'm more active on my personal page, which is at Esmeraldo ESQ. It's also Esmeraldo ESQ on Instagram. Then LinkedIn is Rita and reaching that on LinkedIn. And my email to reach me is IP Series info at gmail.com. Or if you just do a Google search IP Series, I'm sure you see you see my podcast and most of the content that I've put out there. Yeah. I must say that this is not in any way advertising you. No. But I must say that I was just even just going to your content on Facebook, the IPC, the IP series. And yeah. I am very impressed with the Thank volume you. of work that you do. It is, it is, it is phenomenal the work that you do. And I suppose that if anybody wants to learn about intellectual properties and how to protect the intellectual properties and how to grow their assets, then they should actually contact you. And the reason being that we just have a few minutes, you know, the kind of way, so we can't, we cannot do justice to this conversation within this time frame that we have. But I just want to ask you a few more questions quickly. Yeah. Now, uh, what steps should I take to protect my intellectual property from infringement or unauthorized use? Um, the first step will be register it. Okay. Uh, because, and that's because intellectual property is territorial in nature. Um, it's only the jurisdiction that you register it that you get to enjoy the legal backing and protection of the, the law. Um, copyright is automatic. However, it's important, especially in the event of a dispute that you register your work. Uh, if you're based in Nigeria or the UK or Ireland, wherever it is, register your work. Um, so you have instances where, for instance, for trademark, if you've not registered your work, but you have consistently used it for a term of five years in Nigeria or a term of three years in the UK, uh, you are entitled to sue someone for passing off where someone is um, trying to mislead the public 
or damage your goodwill or take advantage of the reputation and good year your brand has garnered. But then we have instances where you know, it, even if your brand is well known, it depends on the law of that country, whether it will fly if you decide to sue someone for, say, a trademark infringement or passing off or trademark dilution or whatever it is. So first step, register it. Um, don't think about the cost because you're going to spend more money if someone should have like you know so for instance in nigeria we apply what is called the first to file principle so who files first will be recognized as the creator or the statutory through creator or author of, author of the work even then when you when, have the digital sorry even when you have the digital track record that you've been consistently using that name so like i stated it's always difficult to prove well, we're not in the first to use. So if it was in America uh, where they applied the first to use, it would be easier. But we apply the first to file in Nigeria. So for instance, if it's a trademark dispute and you have not registered the trademark in that class that affects... So like I said in the beginning, we have 45 classes. So let's say it's class um, 43 that someone you know decides to go and register it. So I think the, this case about the Domitila movie will be throw more light on this, where Domitila, the name of the movie had been in existence since 1996. And the lead actress went ahead to want to trademark the name last year because she was not given the lead role again and based on the, the, the fee she was calling and all of this. Is, and now the trademark registry um, in an opposition filed by Debbie Giro um, stated that she um, did registration in bad faith. So you have instances where the, the law will come to your aid if you can show that someone actually went ahead to do that just to spite you. Um, they did that to take advantage of the popularity. Um, you also have people who are considered to be IP trolls. So they act like cyber, cyber um, what's it called, spotters who go ahead to register domain names and wait for you to come and then they want to sell it out to you, so, something like that. So yeah. do registration um, in the jurisdiction that you want to register. Then if you have events to expand into other jurisdiction as well, you can exploit that the regional um, IP registration system such as OAP or ARIPO or the international space. You can then explore either the EU IP or the US, um, you know, IP offices. Um, have a lawyer on your retainer to help you or guide you on how to actually monetize all of it. There are so many benefits for you when you protect yourself or like when you don't protect. When you don't protect yourself, you give your lawyer more work because now I have to think creatively how to make sure that you get back the rights that you own in that particular work. Um, what else? Create digital footprints, especially in this digital era. Um, you may not be a social person but because you want traction and you want people to actually know you you have to put that content consistently so that people can be able to link you so just look at Hanifa's case if Hanifa hadn't done that um the wrong way that she did and people did not and, and it didn't go viral people would not have been able to identify her as the true um creator of the the virtual runway that she did um, document whatever relationship you're having with anyone, whether it's a collaboration or partnership, uh, make sure you're signing agreements that clearly states each party's contribution, how long the relationship is going to last, uh, what percentage are they entitled to. If you're a creative or a musician, sign your split sheets. Um, if you're a book author, sign your distribution, publishing deals with um, the people that are helping you to print your, docu your books and all of those documents. So that you can be able to track um, the pirates when they start, you know, reproducing your book without your consent. So the copyright, the copyright act now provides that um, people that work in the photocopying industry that publish books and the rest of them must keep a record of the works that they do. So your name, title, when it was published, all of this conversation must be there. Um, take advantage of technology that help you in protecting your work from being used without your consent. Um, like I said earlier, the Nigerian Copyright now has a technological protection measure provision where if you go ahead to make all these provisions, so you've locked or encrypted your audio book or your ebook and someone hacked it and went ahead to reproduce it, 
the law is on your side. If someone uploads your content online, you can file a takedown notice um, and, and, you know, the ISPs and the commission will take, um, take it from there. If it's a full-blown infringement, you can go to, if it's Nigeria, you can file a suit through your lawyer at the Federal High Court or you explore what is called the uh, out of court settlement or alternative dispute resolution me mechanism or online dispute resolution mechanism where you are resolving your dispute either via mediation or arbitration or negotiation or conciliation or using an expert um, to help you in resolving those disputes. So those are like, you know, the benefits of uh, and ways you can actually protect yourself going forward. Fantastic. Now, you know, a lot of people these days have uh, domain names. Can you copyright, like you have a name, for example, Rita, your name is Rita Amuri Chinda. Can you register your name? So basically you can um, under the domain name protection. So um, you can do that or explore the country level, <laughs> trying to remember how it's supposed to, I think the CCLD registrations where you use your country. So for Nigeria is .ng, we have a .ng and we have the um, NIRA who is in charge of registration of domain names or if you have an educational or you're in the academia, you use .edu, .ng, just basically make sure that you interact with the domain name registry or um, agency in charge of all of that so that that way you are protected um how can you get it back you sue you explore the um, uh, uniform domain name dispute resolution mechanism where you should go and show and prove that it's actually like you actually did that person trying to um, take advantage of the fact that um, your brand is not popular so i came across a case where um it, it now holds that celebrities can actually sue people who go ahead to register their domain name in the event of getting money from them. So the law will always do their best to protect you, but you have to be proactive, especially when you know that you're going big. But if you find out that that particular um, domain name is unavailable, then you now have to think outside the book, what other that domain names are important or um, I can actually use. So do I go ahead and use um, dot ng or just um nigeria.com or whatever it is you know something like that so once you have a domain name then that 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 entity belongs to you yeah so domain name is kind of like a trademark it's like a source identifier it helps people link your product to their product but then you then have to deal with issues as to um, AdWords, Meta Tag, for instance, there's this case that involved the uh, MNS. I'm sure you know MNS, mm -hmm. where someone had placed another for a flower online, and the person clicked on the link that he first saw, but it didn't take him to the MNS page, but he still made the order, and then he went to go and sue MNS. So that, so when you go on Google and you type in, say, a website or a word, and you see AD beside it, that's an ad word. Yeah. It's not the original site. So don't click on that because you're going to meet the wrong person. So now you have platforms like Amazon that are saying if you, if someone sells a counterfeited, it's a court judgment for that anyway, someone sells a counterfeited product, you can actually sue the person um, for that. So not Amazon. having a domain not Amazon. Amazon is not the culprit. Amazon has done their work because um, they're giving you a platform to sell. You are not posing as your original person who has the license or the authorization to do that. So you will be the one to, you know, be held responsible because for years people have been suing Amazon like, oh, Amazon is not doing it right. But Amazon has their own distribution resolution mechanism that they use to resolve such or certain this. So back to your question on domain name. Domain name is also like a source identifier for brands. So if at the beginning of, um, let's say, when you find, let's say, while you're registering your IP, you also need to consider, you know, doing a domain name for yourself if you can afford to. So I'm aware that the .ng um, domain name is affordable, not going to say the cost, but... But what about the very, .com? That was the, that's the thing. So if .com, .ng doesn't work for you, go for .ng. .ng is, is way better from what I'm told. That's that's how I'm going to keep it. So instead of doing dot com dot ng, just do dot ng. You know, easy access and 
you know, it's just easy for people to actually locate it. It kind of feels like .com, .ng is like a longer route, you know. So there are levels, there are great levels for domain name, depending on um, the jurisdiction and the country as well. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much for that information. So if you are a content creator, then it's important that you have a domain name and you can also copyright your website. So oh, I know a senior colleague that recently did one and it was considered to be like the first ever at the Nigerian Copyright Commission. So if you have a website, um, other than putting out a copyright notice, you can actually copyright your website. Okay, fantastic. Now, I just want to go back to this whole concept of the digital asset. And we're right to say that in this century that we are today, that the digital asset is the fourth industrial revolution. So can you put your digital asset as part of your inheritance for your children? Oh, yes, yes, you can. Um, so IP and wheels or probates are like very dicey because um, they are intangible assets. And most times when you're considering wheels, you're only focusing on the tangible assets. Mm -hmm. Same thing with when you're trying to get a loan or um, they're asking you for tangible assets. Nobody's thinking of, oh, let me um, evaluate this person's catalog or artwork or sculpture or movie, all of those things. Nobody's thinking about that. So you, you can will your intangible assets to your successors or your heirs in title. You just need to expressly work first, other than working with the wills lawyer, you need to also work with the IP lawyer who will help you identify what your intangible assets are, what's the value of each of these are, uh, and who should get what part of your IP. Or this person can use my trade name or the trademark name for whatever. This person can use the logo. This person can um, is, has the adaptation right, this person has the translation right, this person has the reproduction right, the publishing right, the performance rights. All of those things need to be considered. So you can include your intangibles in your wills. You just need to work with two types of lawyers, the wills lawyer and the IP lawyer so that it's properly documented. So we have instances in Nigeria where um, a musician had died without the will. He's called um, uh, Da Green and several others. Yeah, Dagreen yeah, Da Green, was, remember. Yeah. He died Dagreen very was, tragically. Yes, yeah, so that really was more prominent because it was like you said, he died, it was an untimely death, and there was no preparation for you know making a will and conversations as to who owns what, etc. etc. But then I know two colleagues who were given the briefs to handle all of that and they sorted that out for the family. Um, a typical example again would be Fel the Fela Kuti, the Kuti family. They are extensively monetizing. Like you can't use any elements of fella without the children being on you. So we had the Jagavan era where someone put, you know, Jagavan and put Kuti's face and they're like, no, our image cannot be associated with this. We did not sign up for this. So you as the head or as a successor need to be proactive in terms of monetize, in terms of monitoring how the intangible that you inherited is being used. Um, the Houston family, making lots of money. The Jet Li family as well. There's a case about the Jet Li family where, you know, his um, fighting stance. Mm -hmm. Someone tries to use that. Someone tried to use that to create, um, I think it was for a food chain. And the family or- That's that Bruce Lee, yeah? Bruce Lee. Jet yeah. Li is the son. So, yeah. So trying to, Bruce Lee, thank you. So they had to sue them for all of those things. and. And that's because the children already informed that they inherited X, Y, Z. So other than putting it in, we also need to inform either orally, but it's best that you have your will documented that, okay, this person owns um, my music catalog, my book, my this, my that. They can do whatever it is that they want with it at the end of the day. Fantastic. Now, I think you've spoken extensively on this subject matter and, uh, now, if you have any questions to ask Rita, kindly feel free. You can uh, write your questions on the text box below. If you're watching via YouTube, 
or Zoom or Facebook and Vita is going to answer those questions for you. Vita, I was going to ask you about, uh, to give us real life um, scenarios and you've just done that. Now, I know that you talked about uh, partnership, getting into partnership with people, joint ventures, um, but then I want us to drill down into having joint ventures with people. So for example, you have a little a daughter or a son that has an idea of starting something. You know, of course they, they just started, they're young and they don't really know how that concept will become in future. And so they have a group of friends that they work with to say, oh yeah, I'm trying to do this da 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 da. And eventually, as we say in Nigeria, it blows. And then that becomes a problem with originality and who actual who the idea actually originates from. So how can you up and coming young digital uh, creators collaborate who are collaborating or forming joint ventures with with the with you know with their partners protect themselves for the future? So basically, you as the guardian can sign or act as a trustee for your kids until they are um, adults, 18 or 21, depending on whatever is applicable in your jurisdiction. So you make sure that you also get your child um, or your ward, a lawyer, an IP lawyer that looks out for their... <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. That looks out for their interests when it comes to negotiation. So you find out a lot when you have... Um, um, child actors or child content creators um, it may not be prominent the cases may not be prominent in Nigeria but you so for instance the likes of um, Taylor Swift and um, what's this lady from um, um, it's not problem child now the, the story about I can't remember her name is it this lady, um, I forgot her name but she was on Disney yeah she yes was so, on, but she so let's became... use Let's use Zendaya, for example. Zendaya, Zendaya started as a child actor and she hasn't had any bad publicity so far. Or let's use Beyonce, whose father was representing, who acted as both parent and manager. To At the time. At the time. time. Yes. And then it got to a point where they're like, okay, dad, I think we've had enough of you managing us. We can take it up from, from here. Um, all of those conversations. So you need to... Your child may not understand the implication because to him then he's not seeing it. He hasn't seen the commercial value. And I read of a story where a 13-year-old girl who is an artist, she earns at least two million pounds per artwork that she creates. So she's the one basically taking care of the family. Her own is to draw, you sold this artwork for two million. Okay, cool. But she doesn't know the commercial value that she has or she hasn't been educated. So what you can do for your child at that point in time is one, um, do a crash course or pay for an IP tutorial class for that. I know the EU IPU has um, um, IP for kids. I also know the World Intellectual Property Organization has um, books or write-ups on intellectual property for kids. Um, there's a group, there's a, a IP group in Nigeria called MIPLG. Um, they also have a book on IP for kids. So if you notice that you're your child has like a creative element or talent or an innovative talent. Take the course as a parent. Understand how IP works to make sure that your child is not taking advantage of. Someone told me of a story of a child that built a software and someone was from one of that jurisdiction saw it and said they wanted to buy him off. And I was like, tell that child not to sell that thing. Like, do not sell. You can license, but not sell. I am always against selling because I know the the bundle of rights that the author owns in his work. So once you sell, it's for life. It's for life, so, yeah. Yeah, so what the copyright at name is provision for is um, provision for moral rights. Moral rights gives you the right to prevent third parties from actually distorting elements of your copyrighted work in a way that it causes harm to you. It wasn't expressly stated before, but now it's expressly stated both for um, authors of copyrighted work and authors of related rights, such as performance rights, where you have the likes of folklore, um, actors, musicians, um, um, live performers, all of this conversation. We never used to have that. So you as a parent, take a crash course on intellectual property. The World Intellectual Property Organization has 
a distance learning course, things about three months, takes you through all of the IPs, which includes copyright, trademark, patents, industrial design, trade secret, geographic education, and plant variety. But since you're focusing on the creative aspect, you want to pay more attention to copyright, trademark, um, and then maybe trade secrets, design rights, and patent. Fantastic. And I, I, yeah. Thank you. I just want us to quickly, thank you. <laughs> I just want us to quickly answer this question here. She says, Rebecca says, Rita, thank you for all you do in IP series. I'm a huge fan. Please, I want to ask, are creative works generated with AI subject to copyright protection? At the moment, no. The conversation is still growing. Um, for instance, the Zara of the Dawn book, which I alluded to when I was talking about, that's a US case. Um, what the law provides, not just in Nigeria, but in the US is only human authors are recognized, only human beings are recognized as authors. So I don't know how many of you know the monkey selfie case, but that case show goes to show you that if you're not a human being, if you're not flesh and blood like us, it's not for you. You, if you now want to apply, so what the US have done post the Zara case is they've created a copyright guideline that you must disclose in your application that this work was created with the assistance of an AI tool, but it is not going to be tagged or identified as an AI product because what these tools are doing, they are using a lot of data that are copyrighted from your images to your sound. Now we're having issues as to the music industry where AI is creating this song. We saw the, the weekend, um, the uh, Drake slash the weekend song that went viral. You know, people will always crave um, human elements, no matter how we try to publicize or push the narrative of, oh, we are now, um, entering the, the fifth industrial resolution revolution, we need to start being, you know, think outside the box, explore. Yeah, tech is good, yeah. But it's it, we're never going to get to that point. I know there's a, is it India now or China? One of those countries has a provision that recognizes AI generated work, but full disclosure is required because you are using um, copyright related work, like I stated, and these people that own the original works are not happy that they're using their work. So you put those prompts. Um, I want a song um, that has the voice of Da Green. Da Green has name, image, and likeness already. They are now using his musical composition and sound recording. The sound recording could be owned by one person or more than one person. The composition can be owned by one person or more than one person. The image can be owned by one person or more than one person. Especially when the person has like a, um, a an image making company or a licensing company or management company that takes care of these elements of this individual. So are we going to have AI just copyright protection? I don't think so. At least not in Nigeria at the moment, because I know when the Copyright Act was launched and we had conversations, just that I think the month of April were conversations around the Copyright um, New, um, Act 2022. And when we had um, one of the, the, the people from the Copyright Commission, Mr. Mike Abani, especially today that, I mean, it's, it's conversation that can be heard, but if you're looking at our terrain, the Nigerian sector now, are we really dealing with, is that our primary focus when it comes to copyright? No. Internationally, they are thinking big. You have different cases, the stability AI cases, where different pictures were put up on Twitter, all of this conversation. There's now a new case where a German author up, wanted to opt out from one of these AI tool company and they refused him and sued him for copyright infringement. And I was like, no, it's actually my work. Like that, I, I mean, I put it out there. You can't be suing me for my own work. It's not yours. So this conversation will come out as to ownership, authorship, contributions. What is this work actually eligible for copyright work? Uh, where does the, the, the right start and end? All of this conversation. I don't think um, AI work will be subject to copyright protection anytime. So we also had the case of the Davos AI um, that was patent related, but it was held um, that it did not, it wasn't patentable. There's also another case, I think it's the Tyler AI case. There's a lot of cases that are coming up where people are trying to, it's like they're trying to arm twist the law into accepting their own reality. We haven't gotten to the virtual reality aspect of virtual IP, like, um, virtual intellectual property rights where 
I say I go into the web three or any or the metaverse and I create a metaverse work. What rights do I have when I get there? Those conversations have not been had. What the law will not support is you going ahead to use some other person's content and passing it off as your own or letting people, misleading people to think that you actually created it. So I don't even answer your question, Deborah. Um, Rebecca, apologies. And uh, thank you for being a fun. <laughs> thank you so much. And somebody says, they, uh, Tony here from India says, Solomon Linda of South Africa, Lion Sleeps Tonight song stolen by foreign artists. Thank you. So uh, this was pre 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 digital era. Other than that one, there's also another one about um, I can't remember the artist now, but she didn't even know that her song was being monetized in the US until she had the opportunity to travel and she heard her song and it was some other person. So there are ways that you can actually um, you know be proactive in terms of. I don't really know the full case the full details of about this, but I guess I might have to do my research about this to even more informed um, answer. But with regards to works being stolen by foreign artists, uh, we've seen that a lot in the fashion space where there's conversation as to cultural appropriation, yeah, misrepresentation of um, our, our design. I think there's this guy I follow on, on Instagram. He talks about luxury brand, quiet brands, you know, and he did an extensive research on how most of these big luxury brands came about their logos. And it was really insightful because what most of this, this, um, these logos that are affiliated to African countries, none of them have taken the step to say, okay, I want to do this other than the Namibians um, who the, the checkered dress where it, it was at some point very popular on the runway and they had to you know, engage a lawyer to sue on their behalf. And those conversations were had where People come into our country or to our continent, get inspired, go out there because they know IP is territorial. They then rush and register in their jurisdiction. And then when you want to sue, you don't have to start dealing with cross-border related issues. How popular is your work? Who knows you for this? Blah, blah, blah. And then you now start having words like cultural appropriation. He's um, yeah. infringing on our, our, our tradition, our folklore, our this. It's a very, so it's this, this category of IP was are considered to be sensitive intellectual property. And that is because you're, you're going to be touching on a lot of nerves that you should not even be doing on the first part. Where is your jurisdiction? Where do you start and stop? What does the international space have to stay? And when all of these conversations are being had, we see that those international bodies that your country is signatory to, they're all quiet because they wouldn't want to say something that will upset you and then maybe you could get angry and then go and do something drastic to their headquarters or, or their agency that, you know, we, we, can, we can go all that when it we, comes we, to... We can, we can leave that conversation. <laughs> we know what can yeah, happen. But with regards to the song, I, I, I don't really know much about the, the Lion Sleeps Tonight's story. I might have to do my research about it. But what I would say is, if you're, if you're sure that your song was stolen... So there's one case where... A Ghanaian artist is currently suing Drake for $10 million because Drake's team had attempted to reach out to him. They never got a feedback and he still went ahead to put out the song, you know. So if the hairs feel that the success of the, the dependence of the, uh, the author of Lion Sleeps Tonight um, are interested in actually protecting or getting back the song or getting whatever royalties, they now need to sit down with a lawyer that will come up with the proper strategy as to how to get back their intellectual property rights, um, come up with a good conversation. I know there's this story that someone has shared with me where the true author of um, Matrix mm -hmm. is actually a black woman. So the story okay. is very- Interesting. Is, yes. And she recently got, it wasn't this year anyway, but I think like two, three years ago, after so many years of being in court, she recently got judgment in her favor and is settled for an undisclosed um, royalty settlement. So if I have an ancestor that was a creative and I know that there's commercial value in that, I, I need to be proactive so that my children's children too will benefit from what their grandfather or great grandfather has left for them. Um, but that's what I would say with regards to that. I don't know much about the case, so I can't really give insight or what's um about it but yeah rita thank you so much 
You're Thank welcome. you so much for this time that we've shared. And what I can take away from what you've shared today is the importance of creativity. You know, in the past, um, you had to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or a teacher. Uh, parents didn't like their children to be artists. They didn't like you to have any fiber of creativity in your bones because they would say to you, how are you going to end a living? How are you going to survive with your paintings or your drawings or your poetry, you know? So, and thankfully in today's world, we live in a world now where you can potentially earn from your intangible assets. You can learn from your gifts. You can earn, sorry, from your gifts, from your creativity and from your name. And, and I, would, I would like to add, I think the pandemic also helped as well. It kind of opened everybody's creativity. For instance, Kabi, the guy that doesn't say anything, but just is already a multimillionaire. We are what did he do like this? What did he do? I'm sure you know Kabi. Kabi that he doesn't make any comments. He just acts and then he ends with. Really? So I don't he's, know. I don't know Kabi. Maybe, uh, maybe if I see him, maybe I would know. He's a black guy. I think he's from. Oh, okay, African I know him. Area. I know him. I know. I know the boy. Yeah, I know him. He's one. That. A lot of people have gotten a lot of deals thanks to. I would say post COVID because we never used to have this much digital content creators. Now you can go. So, so you have. So we have the aspect of IP that deals with user generated content, where it's easy for you to go viral as long as you can able to grab consumers' attention within the first um, is it ten seconds? I mean, we have like. So if it's not interesting enough to me, I just move to the next post. So TikTok was one that actually blew everyone's mind. I mean, everyone was using Instagram for pictures, Facebook for pictures. But then TikTok came with, and everyone was dancing and doing a lot of challenge, and everyone was like, ah. So the pandemic also contributed yeah. a lot. And I've seen that in Nigeria, a lot of um, creative conversations are being had. We have, there's a lot of webinars, a lot of trainings. So if you're a creative, you're a musician, you work within the music industry, there's a, there's a training. This is an advert, and that's because I, I participated in it, and I always like to sign up for creative-related um, trainings just so that I know what's happening. Okay, if I if I attend, and maybe I know most of what they're saying, okay, it's not bad, but then I can meet people. Um, like they say, your, your network is your network. Is your network. Someone, yeah, but someone said, if you look at it from that area, you're focusing on the money, as and I'm like, no. If you know a lot of people, as an access can get you into doors that you are not, you would not ordinarily have gotten into. So a lot of digital content creators in Nigeria have been able to, you know, got they've gotten deals into acting movies, uh, representing big brands like Techno and the rest of them, being on runway for big fashion collaborators that they would never have to do that, you know, participated, gotten sponsorship deals. I mean, all of these conversations have been heard. So there's a lot to be thankful for. The pandemic was bad, but also a lot of people benefited from it because sitting down at home for locked in doors, you just had to think of something. I mean, the likes of Travis Scott made over $4 million from you know, organizing a virtual concert, concert that people I mean, participated um, for, for users of Fortnite. They were able to participate and have a virtual concert. You know? So you now have to think out of the Outside box, especially the box. now. You are thinking out of the box, especially in this digital era now. What can I do that will make me stand out? And this is where trademark will come in. Trademark basically is a source identifier. It differentiates you from party A to party B. Copyright is what is unique about your work. What is that unique character about your book, about your post, about your this? What are you sharing? So a lot of information right now. It used to be YouTube where everyone goes to them, but now everyone can create like a short short series content on TikTok or on Instagram or Facebook and share. Makeup artists everywhere. We have, I mean, every day we're learning new things, basically. How to wear your dress, how to create an earring, how to bake, all of these conversations. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Vita. It's been a very enlightening, informative, and I hope a transformative formative conversation. And guys, if you're watching this program for the first time, my name is Ibinabo Enebi, 
And you can follow me on my, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ibinabo Enabi. You can follow me on my social media handles, Ibinabo Enabi on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'm on TikTok as well. I'm just still starting, you know. So, and Rita, once again, where can they find you? Oh, Rita and Richinda on LinkedIn, um, IP series on uh, um, Spotify for podcasters, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stretcher, and a whole lot. So I'm also on Instagram and on TikTok. We're still trying to get the hang of TikTok. TikTok is on a different level. <laughs> but I have a, a page on Facebook. Uh, most of my contents are posted on Twitter and LinkedIn on my personal page but i always um reshare on my um content creation page uh, which is um instagram for ip series with peter um but yeah just peter, can i ask you a quick Instagram. question sure would your posts on social media handle become tangible assets for you in future definitely definitely i mean if i'm looking for sponsorship deals now I just need to get my data meta um, and, you know, share with my sponsors that this is how much I've done within the last, for instance, um, for instance, the, I did, so when this Hilda Bass's cooking, cookathon was going on, that was on Sunday, I was watching, you know, following the conversation. I just said, I just thought to myself, what, is that, what are the IP elements of this whole thing? You know, and that post alone on LinkedIn has gotten me over almost twenty-one thousand views, which is really yeah. In in twenty-four hours, like I would just wake up and see. I don't. I wasn't even getting notifications. So when I come in, I just see like I just keep seeing like more people have liked it, more people have liked it, but very few people were commenting. Then on Instagram, I my the post um interacted with about thousand two hundred people or pages or whatever. And, you know, so when something is actually happening, you have to be part of that conversation as is mm-hmm. ongoing. That's mm-hmm. the bit about a digital content creator. So, um, for instance, we had the issue of the LUP conversation in Nigeria. Everyone was, you know, tagging into it. And that's what the digital era does. Once something is popular, everyone wants to be part of it. Knowingly or knowingly, commercially or non-commercially, everyone just wants to, you know, receive the grace from that particular content at that point in time. So Peter, um, we have to go. And yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. And I have this post here. Thank you so much, IB and Rita. This program is a huge resource. God bless you. Rita, oh, thank, thank you. you very much. You are a delight. <laughs> and I've learned a lot. And I will call you and thank you, everybody. And bye. Mwah, 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 mwah. Bye. bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Kitchi. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.